Welcome everyone and today I'm going to be talking about one of my favourite birds, the red kite. Now first of all just to say Happy New Year, I realise it's already what about halfway through January but this is the first video of 2022 and there's a couple of changes hopefully I've managed to figure out how to put these little graphics at the bottom of the screen and really really amazed you. Also you'll notice I've got a little fluffy thing here. Uh, just on my jacket. Uh, so it's the first time I've used this wireless mic, so please give me some feedback on the sound quality. This video is all about photographing red kites, and I'm very lucky here, uh, close to where I live, red kites were released, oh, at least 15 years ago now in Bramham and Harewood and I'm only about half an hour from there or even less so I'm so lucky to have these birds close by uh, just a quick journey and I can photograph these amazing raptors. You're probably thinking I'm going to talk about photographing red kites in flight so that's exactly what I'm going to do first. Now the great thing about red kites is that they're a fairly big bird so similar to eagles and buzzards they can actually be quite slow flying and that can make it much easier for photography so if they're just in their sort of gentle flights with flapping and gliding then they can be relatively slow birds that makes it so much easier on certain days with the right weather they may start to circle so this is quite common these birds will circle so you might get them to start circling but they'll still be going in a general direction so it might look like they're kind of coming back on themselves but they're just sort of circling still going in a general direction so bear that in mind and as the bird is flying, potentially circling around, changing direction, think about how the light is hitting the bird. So have a look at the light and you'll probably find at a certain point that the light is just hitting the bird a little better and that's when you want to take your pictures. Another thing they absolutely love, like many birds of prey, is the wind. So if you've got wind in your favour and the bird's flying into that wind, it can just be fantastic for photography. It will slow the bird down so much and sometimes you can almost have the birds just hanging there. And I've seen this numerous times as they fly into the wind, almost just hanging there, hardly moving at all. So if you get that, it's so much easier to photograph and potentially you can use a slower shutter speed as well. Some of the technical things when it comes to photographing red kites in flight. First of all, what lens should you use? That's going to depend to an extent. If you really can't get close to the bird, then you're probably going to have to use something like a 500, 600 millimeter, in which case you're probably better using a tripod. Now, if the birds are more approachable, and this would apply to feeding sites, for example, then you could probably use a 400 millimeter or even a 300 millimeter lens. There are situations where I think you could even use less than a 300 millimeter lens where uh, where the birds are feeding and they're just not bothered about you at all just for flight photography of course now the thing with tripods i absolutely hate tripods not generally i hate tripods for flight photography i cannot stand it i do not get on with it um, i've done it a number of times but i much prefer to hand hold so even if it's a very big lens i will still prefer to hand hold it i can't do it for very long um, but I'll prefer that option. But generally speaking, if you're using a long lens, I would probably advise you use a tripod and either a gimbal or a fluid head. In terms of shutter speed, I'd try and keep the shutter speed a thousandth of a second or more, which is a safe bet. And then with your tracking focus, uh, you probably want to use either a group focus or if you've got a more modern camera, then something like the, the eye, animal, bird, eye, autofocus. And I think that's going to serve you well. Light and exposure, and this is the big one, and particularly light in my opinion. Now I probably get more questions on this than anything else, which is how do you expose birds against the sky? How do you stop it coming out too dark? And now personally, I always like to have some light for photographing red kites, so I wanna have some sunshine. Today, I can turn around, I can turn around and still speak because this amazing microphone. Today is just a deep blue sky. There's pretty much no clouds anywhere. So I would rather have these kind of conditions for red kites in flight. Just the sunlight hitting the bird with so many wonderful colours in there, it really gives some extra bite to the images and shows off that plumage and also that background. It just keeps it very simple, a very simple but colourful background as well. Now the other option is you can use uh, like a cloud backdrop. So you still want to have some sunshine, but if you can have that combination of sunshine and a dark cloud backdrop, I would say that's arguably even better. And I've got some of my favorite flight shots in those conditions when the situation has allowed. The problem with bright sunshine, and this is a problem for a lot of things, but particularly for birds in flight, 
is that when the sun is very high, it just causes problems. So if the sun is high in the sky and you're shooting up, it causes issues whereby you get lots of shadows. So you often get shadows under the wings and even the body of the bird as well. Now, the main way around this is simply to try and shoot when the sun is lower. So personally, I'd like to have some, have some sunshine, uh, but I try and shoot when the sun is lower in the sky. And it's probably within you know, an hour of sunset or an hour of sunrise. And then what happens is it just illuminates the bird so much more because it's kind of, it's coming from underneath rather than from above. So it's illuminating the underside and that is always the difficult part. Now in terms of exposure, if you are shooting towards the sky, um, if it's really deep blue, then you might find that the exposure is fairly accurate. It's not too bad. But the problem is if the, if the sky is a little lighter or it's very, very white for sure, then the exposure meter gets confused. So in that case, what I'd suggest you do is you just overexpose. If you're using like evaluative metering, um, you're photographing the red kite, flying against the sky, then with evaluative metering, just overexpose. And you probably want to expose anything from plus two thirds up to plus two or even beyond that. And it will just brighten up the bird and it will also brighten up the shadows underneath as well. The other option is that you can use spot metering, which I personally don't like. I talked about it before. There's nothing wrong with that. And if it works for you, stick to that. You could use spot metering, track the bird in flight, and then the camera is gonna take the exposure meter, uh, the exposure reading, sorry, from the underside of the bird and hopefully you get a more accurate exposure. The main thing here that's going to improve your pictures of those red kites in flight is when the light hits the bird. And that often happens when the bird changes direction. So this is what you want to do is to watch the bird flying. Look at the angle you're at, look where the sun's at and just see how the light is hitting the bird. It's really, really important. And you'll find at certain times the light will hit it better. And that's when you want to take your most of your pictures. So commonly, is when the bird will come to bank round. It'll suddenly change direction. Maybe it turns with its back to you, some of the nicest shots. And when they bank like that, they're gonna catch the light so much better. So sometimes it's just a, a little jink in the air, a change of direction. And that is when you're gonna get better lighting on the bird. So we talked about photographing red kites kind of in a, a more standard flight, but what about when they're diving? And this is something I just love to do. One of my favorite things ever, photographing diving red kites. Uh, with this forecast as well, I'm hoping to get out this afternoon and do exactly that, hopefully against this blue sky. Now in this situation, this is often where they're gonna be feeding. Uh, maybe you come across red kites, they are scavengers. So maybe you come across them, they found some food and you can see them diving down. Maybe it's at a feeding station that you visited uh, maybe you're someone who just kind of feeds them occasionally supplementary, which I'll come to later. Now, this is one of the hardest things to do because they are just so fast. So this is where they up the speed massively. They can be relatively slow flying a lot of the time, but when it comes to diving for food, they are anything but. This is where you're gonna to have to maximize everything on your camera. So depending on what you've got, you just wanna maximize everything you possibly can, maximize the focusing speed, maximize the frame rate. Um, depending, if your camera's advanced enough, then look at the cases, look at the autofocus case settings. You might wanna change that. There's a few other things you might wanna look at as well. Uh, you might wanna go for a, a larger group focus to track the bird. Uh, so just maximize everything as much as you can. Once they go into that dive, they go super, super fast. And your shutter speed, you want to up that as well. So if you're often shooting around one thousandth of a second, for your diving kites, forget about that. Um, probably almost impossible. I would say you want to be up at 2,000, one, 2,500 of a second, or even faster than that. So give yourself the best chance that you can. Now what I find as well is kind of when they go into a dive and you kind of get to learn when they're going to do this, but when they go in twist and go into that dive, they move so fast that I don't really think about trying to track the bird. It, um, it, I just try and follow the movement as much as I can. And it's almost like I just almost drop the camera. I don't really think about tracking it perfectly. I just literally just sort of drop the camera to not throw it on the floor, which I did in Costa Rica and broke my lens. It's about watching the behavior and you'll notice sometimes the usual kind of behavior is that the kite will circle round, it's a bit higher, then it'll probably drop. 
it'll probably drop and circle again, well this time lower. That's usually a sign that it's ready to go for the food. So when it's circling at a lower height, just get ready. Look for that little change in body language, in behavior, and that is usually just <clears throat> any movement. It will just suddenly jink, and when it does that, it's probably gonna twist and turn and dive. Um, do not expect to get lots of sharp pictures. If you go into this with the expectation that you're gonna get dozens and dozens of sharp images of diving kites, you're probably gonna be rather disappointed. Um, so just think to yourself, you know, if I get, if I get just a handful of really sharp images of this, that is a success. And that's the way I try to think of it. Take, you know, the more pictures you can take, the better and just keep persisting. Yes, and I nearly forgot that as well. The great thing about when they dive, we talked earlier about how photographing them in flight, you wanna watch for the light to see how the light is hitting the bird. This works so well when they're diving. The reason is that when they turn, you'll find that you don't really get any issues with the light. So you don't get those, those shadows as much across the bird. So if the bird turns, uh, because it can often be sort of like that, um, you know, the back is towards you or the front is towards you and you don't really have those issues with the light and shadows. So you get much better lighting, generally speaking, when they go into a dive. A really useful situation for photographing red kites in flight is if you can find a roosting site. Now red kites are quite gregarious birds and they often come together uh, at roosting time at the end of the day. Now this is something probably I've noticed in red kites more than any other bird of prey. Uh, they do seem to often congregate like this and you can have really big roost sites. I've been lucky enough to come across one or two. Now this can be great for photography <clears throat> for a few reasons. The first is that you're just going to have more red kites so more opportunities for photography the second is because it's a roost site they're going to be there uh, at the end of the day when the sun is getting lower so you're guaranteed that you're going to have lower sunshine and generally speaking much better light for photography and the other thing is that um, you just seem to get more interaction I find when you've got more birds like this coming together, I just seem to see so much more interaction. And again, it's something I've noticed probably more with red kites. They seem to interact with each other quite a lot in flight. Um, I think most of it's kind of play. I don't think it's so much aggression. It's more kind of practice and communication rather than aggressive behavior, I think. So I've seen this many, many times and I've managed to photograph it a few times as well. So there's a, there's a lot of good reasons there why roof site can be so good. If you do find a roof site, then please bear in mind, you, not, you, know, you don't wanna cause any disturbance. That's really important. And it's, if it's one that you find that nobody else does, then potentially, you know, just keep it to yourself and don't tell anybody else. Um, you want to make sure you don't disturb these birds of prey. If they get disturbed regularly enough at a roosting site, then they're going to leave there and potentially go somewhere else. Also, you've got potential of some perched pictures. Um, they may favour certain trees and eventually they're going to land in those trees and settle to roost for the night. I often found oak trees, one of their favourites, and I've seen a number of red kites landing and roosting in various oak trees. So you may have a chance for some uh, perch shots which are unusual the likelihood is you're going to be further away they're not going to be um, they, you know they're not going to let you get as close as they would photographing them in flight so you're probably going to use a long lens maybe you need to use an extender with it as well you've also got potential for silhouettes you know at the end of the day once the sun does go down if the kites are still flying around I've done that something I've really really enjoyed I like photographing silhouettes of birds in flight I mentioned feeding earlier in the video, feeding sites for photographing diving red kites. So what about feeding these birds? Should we actually be doing that? Um, everyone's gonna have different opinions on this. My, my personal opinion is that I feel comfortable with baiting birds of prey occasionally in an erratic manner, kind of as supplementary food. And I mean, I've only ever done it in the winter as well. I'm not so sure about outside of the winter. Uh, but I think if you're gonna do it, I think it's better to do it in a more erratic manner to kind of mix it up when you put the food out there. Um, so it's kind of mimicking the natural behavior of the bird as a bird of prey and with a red kite as a scavenger. So that's my personal opinion on that, but feel free to let me know what you think. I don't wanna go about it too deeply into this video. Now I have baited 
uh, various birds of prey, including red kites, over the years. And one of the best experiences I ever had by a mile, and one of the best photography and wildlife experiences of my entire life was photographing red kites in the snow. Forgive me if I've shown these before. I know some of you have seen these, but I'm gonna show you some of these pictures. Some of you, some of these images I've never shown on YouTube. Now this was over about six days. I was lucky enough to have a good site for this with permission to the, from the landowner. And I baited the kites with rabbit. So a nice natural food source. I put out the rabbit in the snow. And the first thing to come was the crows because they kind of come to investigate and check it out. And then the next bird was the buzzard. And then eventually, after waiting long enough, the red kites did come down. And this was just such a magical experience. And we had heavy, like really heavy, heavy snow. It was a very cold winter for a prolonged period. Hence the equipment, you see the equipment that these images were taken on, which was, uh, you know, much more basic equipment to uh, what I progressed on to. So what you'd have is the, the buzzards would come in and take some food and then eventually the kites after perching in the nearby oak trees would fly in and they'd start to feed as well. They don't have a lot of power. They are, they are big birds, they've got big wingspan, but they don't have a ton of power and strength. So what they seem to do is actually wait for the buzzards to get into the carcass first. And I saw this myself personally, that the buzzards would go in and it was only after they'd kind of ripped the carcass open, uh, but then the red kites would actually come in and they'd start to feed as well. And the images I got were just absolutely incredible. It was very, very cold and the situation I was in was very cold and doing about six hours um, in this hide. But the images were amazing. And I saw, I saw so much, like just so much interaction that I couldn't believe. Um, you just, what you learn sometimes from being in a hide. Some of the interaction between birds was almost bizarre. Uh, there was one point where they almost came together almost like nuzzling one another. And then another time where one kite kind of pushed the other, but it wasn't very aggressive. It was almost like a, a half, a half-assed attempt to just push it off the food. And then a couple of times there was, you know, all out aggression with kites um, flapping wings and tails in the snow and trying to get the food, whichever bird was the most dominant. Um, what was interesting as well was to see that they don't waste anything, not like us humans that waste so much food um, and everything else on this planet, but uh, birds of prey do not waste their food. And I watched this one rabbit just get stripped almost bare. Sorry if you are a bit squeamish for the next image, look away now. But this just shows you, um, you know, how much they're gonna finish that rabbit off and leave nothing to spare. And this was a kite that decided that the rabbit was now light enough that it could pick it off, pick it up and take it away. The conditions for this photography shoot were just absolutely incredible. Proper heavy snow, absolutely beautiful. And a few things look as good in those conditions as a colorful red kite. But a word about photographing them in the snow. Now in my experience, I found this and I think it's the case with other birds of prey. So you might think it's a great example to, uh, the snow comes along, I think this is the perfect time to get out, um, maybe use a bit of food and to photograph those red kites. And that makes sense. However, I think what happens often is that they just decide to wait it out. So what I mean is that rather than come down and maybe get some food or certainly look for food, they just decide it's better to conserve energy. Now I know this is the case with eagles and I'm sure other birds of prey. Um, if there is snowfall, they may just decide to do this. They decide, I'm just gonna sit on a branch um, and wait it out and conserve energy because I don't wanna have to waste energy to find food in these cold conditions and that makes sense. So I've experienced this myself when I've gone out trying to photograph red kites in the snow and they've just disappeared. So places where you usually have them there most of the time and they've just vanished. Or I can see them sat not too far away in the trees and I've tried, you know, I've used some food and they've not come down. So I have seen this from experience. Now the interesting thing with, uh, with some big birds of prey is they have a crop. <clears throat> it's what's called a crop. Sometimes you'll see it bulge out. It's kind of lower neck at the top of their chest. And this is actually for food storage. So they can store food for a little while so particularly in, in very cold conditions, um, it's just a way of storing food to get them through for a little bit longer so they don't have to go and find food. Now, I assume this is the case with kites. Um, 
I have not seen, I've not read about that, but I assume it's the same with red kites. I know this is the case with eagles and buzzards and other birds of prey. So there's a certain amount of time that the bird can go without food and using that storage facility that it's got as well. Now for the bigger birds, they may be able to go three days maybe, I don't know, three days say, without, without eating, without finding food and just using their storage. With the red kites, I imagine it's definitely less than that. But the thing here is, if you have a situation where it just snows for one day, and this is really common in the UK and it drives me mad, but uh, you have a situation where it snows for one day and that's it, and it might be fairly heavy snow cover, there's a chance that the red kite is just gonna decide, I don't need to feed today. And I'm just going to wait it out. So just bear that in mind. What I would say is if it's a prolonged period of snow like it was when I took those images, uh, if it goes on for a few days or a week or longer then they are going to be forced to feed. So they're not going to be able to just sit there and conserve energy because they can only do that for so long. They're going to have to go out and feed. So a situation where you've got heavy constant snow a lot of snow on the ground may be frozen as well. If you get that for a number of days or a week, then I would suggest that's a really good time to try and photograph the red kites and a good time to use supplementary food as well. I'm gonna put another video up on the screen, which I hope you enjoy. If you enjoyed this video and you're not subscribed, then please do me the honor of subscribing. Uh, give me some feedback on the fluffy thing as well, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.